Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I'm very excited about this show today. This is not something that I typically do on my channel, but I mentioned something in the community tab and you guys all said, let's go for it. So today we're going to be talking about what has turned into my favorite television show currently, which is Yellow Jackets. Now, I, I, I understand that I'm probably going to get some people on this channel who have never watched me before just because Yellow Jackets is such a big show and has such a huge fan base. So if you are new, if you're one of those people that just clicked on this video because you saw Yellow Jackets, welcome. I'm really, really glad that you're here. Um, if you are a fan of Yellow Jackets, then obviously you're probably... I'm assuming probably a fan of folklore, conspiracy, mysteries. And so I will put down in the description box below my conspiracies playlist, as well as my Mystery Monday playlist, if you would like to check out those. This is the first time, though, that I'm ever covering a TV show. Now, if you've never seen Yellow Jackets, first of all, you're missing out. I highly suggest you watch it. It's brilliant. Second of all, I'm going to be giving some spoilers. I'm not going to be holding back on on what happens in the storyline. So I'm just giving you a warning right now that there are going to be spoilers in this. If you want to watch season one and season two first before watching this episode, totally up to you. Don't say I didn't warn you because this is your warning. Now, most of you who are have been following me for a long time know that I, I dig research. I love to research. I love the art of storytelling. This is what I studied in, before I went off to India and studied philosophy and Sanskrit and all that stuff in India. I studied uh, literature in school. I, I interned in the West End in London. I also interned at a radio station. Um, and so I am very, very, very much into the art of storytelling. And that's kind of how I started my channel anyway, was just trying to look at these weird these this folklore and conspiracies and mysteries from a storytelling format and yellow jackets in my opinion is one of the most fantastic stories and projects that gives us so much to contemplate when it comes to character development and the reality of what these characters are going through in this story. And that, my friends, is why art is so important. Because no matter where we come from in this world, whether it's different countries, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different religions, different races, different genders, different political backgrounds, whatever. At the end of the day, we all have an emotional center. We all deal with human suffering. We all de deal with the human condition. So things like fear, abandonment, psychosis, which we're going to talk about with yellow jackets, um, the need to be accepted, deceit, jealousy, all these complex human emotions we all deal with and can understand at a very visceral level. And this is one of the reasons why I think yellow jack jackets is so sensational. Now, of course, we're going to be talking a lot about trauma because... I mean, that's kind of the point of the show. Um, and so if you're triggered by any type of discussion about PTSD or CPTSD, I'm giving you this warning now. Normally, I don't give those warnings, but I know I'm probably going to be attracting some new new viewers. So I just want to let you know we are going to heavily talk about trauma and psychosis and all that kind of stuff, neurosis, along with, with the subject of the television series. So Cliff Notes versions, what's the crux of Yellow Jackets? Yellow Jackets is basically a story about a girls soccer team who goes to nationals in 1996 and crashes into a forest in Ontario. And they are out there. They're stuck out in the wilderness for about 19 months, according to what I've read. Today, Friday, May 26th is the day that the last episode of season two drops. So I've just read they're out. They're still out in the wilderness. As far as I'm concerned, as of right now, they haven't been rescued yet. However, the brilliant thing about this show is that it goes back and forth between 1996 and the present time. And so you're seeing these traumatic events happen to these girls who already have a history together because they are presumably kids that grew up together they're in high school and so there's a very you know the kids you grow up with there's a very special bond 
that you have with the kids that you grew up with. Those are deep friendships. And it's, it's not like when you're an adult where you have you have the option to walk away from people. In a lot of cases with children, you can't walk away from the kids you grew up with. You just kind of got to grow up together and go through your growing, growing pains together. So even before, if you think about the psychology of these characters, even before they were put in this, this like super survival situation, they already have a massive history together, right? Um, they're also on a team. They're on a soccer team together. So they've learned to work together and they're really talented. They're really talented soccer players. Hence why they're flying to go off to nationals. Now, again, this does take place. The, the crash, the crux of the trauma takes place in 1996, which is another element of the story that I personally love because in 90, 1996, I was 13 years old. And so a lot of the music that they play, um, a lot of the references that they make, um, I can relate to because the characters that get stuck in the wilderness are only a few years older than me. So again, in 1996, I would have been in what, like the eighth grade. These were seniors in high school. So there's not that big, there's not that much of an age gap between me and, and these characters. So I appreciate that. I appreciate the references. You also have to remember in 1996, the world was very different. We did not have cell phones. We did not have the internet. Um, it was just a very different world than, than what kids have today. Now, it goes back and forth between 1996 and the current time. And so you're seeing the trauma of what happened in 1996 in the plane crash play out in these women's lives in their 40s. Now, along with the trauma of, of being stuck in the wilderness for 19 months, there's a lot of mysteries at play as well. And that's some stuff that as the audience, I know some of the mysteries have been kind of revealed, um, but not all of them. And so something really major happened to these girls out in this wilderness, out in this forest for the months that they were stranded out there. One of these things that happens to these girls is cannibalism. And we're going to get deeper into that because I have quite a few things to say about that, quite a few views on how they played this, um, this situation. And so we're when we go back and forth between what happened in 1996 and the present day, in the present day especially, you're seeing, again, the effects of the years of, of PTSD, of, of trauma, of trying to go back to normalcy, of trying to keep secrets because of shame. Or, again, there might be more information they haven't revealed yet that's going to come out in season three or season four. Um, and so it's, it's a very intense intense place to be now with that being said the cast is unbelievable and i'm just going to show you guys quickly before we get into the story again who who the cast is because you have actresses that are playing present day characters and then actresses playing the the teenage the 1996 characters so we have melanie lewinsky i think she's amazing and um, I've, I've always been a fan of her. She's a very underrated actress. She's brilliant. She plays the character of Shauna, as does Sophie Nalesi. I hope I'm saying that right. She plays teen Shauna. Now, Shauna is best friends as a teenager with a girl named Jackie, played by Ella Purnell. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you a spoiler. This is the first person they eat. That's why there's no um, adult Jackie, because she doesn't make it. And we'll get into how that, that comes about. But... Jackie has a boyfriend named Jeff. Jeff is played by Warren Cole. This guy, Jeff Sadecki, Warren Cole as the adult. There's also a teenage Jeff. I don't see his picture up here, but that's the adult Jeff. So Jackie is in a relationship with Jeff. We see this in the pilot episode. So uh, Shauna is Jackie's best friend. Jackie is kind of like the prima donna popular girl in high school. Shauna is kind of the sidekick, right? And that's Shauna again is played by Melanie Lewinsky as an adult. Now, Jackie is having relations with Jeff, but not intercourse. Shauna goes behind Jeff, uh, Jackie's back and has intercourse with Jeff. So Jeff basically got two girlfriends <laughs> when the plane crashes. Only problem is Jackie is not aware that he's boinking Shauna. Well, the problem, again, it, it gets exposed. The affair gets exposed because Shauna is pregnant 
when the plane crashes, although she doesn't know she's pregnant until she misses her period. So that's a that's a huge part of this story is this teenage girl being pregnant out in the wilderness with her best friend's boyfriend. All right, so that's Shauna and Jackie. Next, we have Misty. Misty is, I, I freaking love Misty. Misty and Natalie, in my opinion, these two are, Natalie's character is a little bit more, um, a little darker. She's got some real funny lines. Um, Misty is kind of the comic relief as the adult. She's such a freaking sociopath, but but I don't know if she's a sociopath because that's what the trauma did to her or if that's just how she was. So M Misty is played as the adult, is played by Christina Ricci. We all know Christina Ricci. I grew up with Christina Ricci. And the teen Misty is Samantha Henratty, I hope I'm saying her last name right. She's brilliant. This girl is freaking genius the way that she plays Misty. Misty is kind of this desperate kid. Like she wants to be the cool girl. You kind of see flashbacks before the plane crash where she gets ma made fun of. And this kind of is, is what prolongs their stay in the wilderness because Misty is also the kid that's obviously done all of her homework. Like she's taken the... Um, the uh the classes on how to uh revitalize people she studied things and so she's not misty herself is not on the soccer team she's like the water girl so that's kind of she's kind of not really a part of the team but is and when the plane crashes she misty is the one that kind of like saves the day because she knows how to do shit and people are freaking out like coach ben here who's played by steven krueger he survives but coach ben's got to get his leg chopped off and so misty's the one that can do it and so she's kind of saving the day and and after the first night she overhears a couple of the girls talking about how they're so glad misty's here like thank god for misty man like she's saving the day and so misty has never had this type of attention before so misty goes and destroys i don't know what it's called but that thing in the airplane that like alerts traffic controller of where the airplane is so they can find where it is to rescue them she goes and destroys that because she wants to camp out in the woods a little bit longer because she's loving all the attention she's getting from all of her teammates who before maybe didn't think that highly of her she also has a mad crush on coach ben who we come to find out is actually gay. And throughout the story, she, a couple of times she's tried drugging him with mushrooms. It's, it's a whole thing. All right, so that's Misty. Now, Natalie is played by the amazing Julia Lewis um, as an adult and by Sophie Thatcher as a teenager. She's incredible too. She made her voice match Julia Lewis's voice. It's unbelievable. Now, the character of Natalie is kind of like the girl that comes from the wrong end of the railroad tracks. She's, she's kind of had a rough life. Um, she's all as a teenager, we see her drinking a lot, you know, she's, but she's also probably out of all the girls, the most grounded and the most realistic. And as the adult, it's interesting. We, we meet Natalie as an adult coming out of rehab again. And I thought that was interesting because it seems like Natalie out of all the girls is the one who's really accepted psychologically accepted what happened to them and um accepting it's accepted that it happened and that's why she has turned as an adult she already had a propensity obviously for um alcohol and drugs but that's why as an adult she is kind of struggling is because i think i think shauna misty um, we'll get into Lottie. Uh, I think they've all kind of have their own way of, of, of kind of working through what happened. And a lot of it is to kind of maybe try to ignore it. But for Natalie, that's just my perception. I really like the character of Natalie. And I feel like she's the one that is really, is really viscerally feeling what happened out there in that wood. We also have Van, who is played by Liv Hewson. And the um, adult Van is played by Lauren Ambrose. Um, we also have Taisha. The uh, teenager is played by Jasmine Savoy Brown. She's got a lot going on. Like she starts sleepwalking and this whole other person uh, comes out. Her adult Thaisa is played by Tawny Cypress. Now Van and Thaisa are lesbians and they're in a relationship. In as teenagers, they kind of come out to their cast, their castmates. They come out to their, well, their teammates um, in the forest that they're 
a couple. I don't think anybody's really surprised. Um, but anyway, they end up splitting up as adults. We meet Ty as an adult. She's running for a governmental office. She's very wealthy. She's married to another woman. She has a son. She ends up kind of slipping back into her psychosis into like sleepwalking. She ends up killing the dog, which is very sad and putting his head on an altar. Anyway. Yeah. She, uh, we also have Lottie. This is teen Lottie, Courtney Eaton, and that is played by, let's see, where is um, Simone uh, Kessel is the adult Lottie. Now, Lottie is a very fascinating character because Lottie comes from a very wealthy family. And it is Lottie's father who paid for the plane, the private plane, to go to Seattle, the plane that crashed. Lottie herself was diagnosed as like a schizophrenic something. She was on some sort of medication because we see her as a little child of flashback, having visions, knowing things were going to happen before they happen. And so her family puts her on medication. Well, of course, once the plane crashes, she doesn't have that medication anymore. So we see Lottie going back into her. I don't know if you want to call it a disability or an ability that's yet to be decided because there are some things that she's able to do that the others aren't. Now, as an adult, since Jackie's gone, as an adult, um, Shauna and Jeff are married. Uh, they do end up getting married and they have a daughter named Callie. Now, I told you that Shauna was pregnant um, Callie is not the child that she was pregnant with. Um, we will get to that. Now we also have Travis and we have Travis's little brother, Javi right here. It's funny. I was watching just a side note. I was watching some English people talk about the show and they kept calling him Javi. It's adorable. <laughs> um, maybe it's cause we have a lot of Spanish speakers in the United States, but that's Javi, not Javi. <laughs> um, okay. So Travis is on the flight with Javi, his little brother, because Travis's father is their coach. He's going with them, with their father. He's not a part of the team. He's just hanging out with his dad. And of course, we've got all these teenage girls. Well, Javi and Travis do survive the plane crash. Their father does not. So we've got basically a gaggle of girls. There's a bunch of other characters like Aquila. Mari, um, Laura Lee is there. She dies pretty soon. She tries to, we'll get into it. Um, and so you've got this like gaggle of girls and one adult, which is coach Ben, you know, and then we've got these two teenage boys. Now talk about Lord of the flies happening. Good Lord. Teenage girls are way worse than boys. Any, any day. So, we're going back and forth. There's this reporter that's looking for information on what happened to those girls out there in the wilderness in modern times. Turns out Taisha hired that reporter to make sure none of her friends were going to squeal on her because she's now running for political office. However, as we see with Taisha, she starts going into like crazy mode where this other side of her is coming out. She's killing the dog. She's sleepwalking. She's doing all this shit that that's crazy. Um, so maybe it's not her friends she should be worried about. All right. And maybe it's her. So that's kind of going on in season one while we're also watching from the past the plane crash unfold. Misty has now destroyed the machine that tells air traffic control where they're located, but nobody else knows that but Misty. And now they've got to figure out how the Fuck, they're going to survive out in the wilderness. Let me tell you something, friends. I have traveled this world. I have spent many, many years in India. I have spent many times out in the bushes of Africa. I've been in the Australian outback. I don't think there's any way, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, that I would survive in the Ontario wilderness. And the whole time in my head, I'm thinking, wow, they must really stink. Like, can you imagine being stuck in the woods for all that time? Don't have any more deodorant. You're out of toothpaste, like no shampoo. You must really fucking stink. Now, I guess at that point, you're not really going to be thinking about your armpits. You're going to be thinking about when are we going to be rescued? Am I ever going to see my family again? You, There's one scene where they have like their boom box that's battery operated and they're listening to some music and then it just dies and so now all of a sudden all 
Any type of connection to the outside world is gone. Just think about that for one minute. It's gone. No cell phone, nothing. You don't even have tampons. Like you are literally with nothing. In the beginning, it was, it was hysterical because they were dividing up the snacks they had on the airplane. They had the snack wells, like devil cookies. Do you guys remember those? My grandmothers used to eat those all the time. I laughed when I saw them. So like cutting them in half, like trying to make these things last. But it comes to a point where they realize, they think they're going to be rescued soon, but they're not. So they realize, yo, like we've got to move. We've got to do something. They find a lake They go to the lake. They swim in the lake. Must have felt great. That greasy hair. And you know, when when the plane was going down, you know they must have been like sweating like crazy from the adrenaline of, oh my God, we're going to die. On top of that, they literally have seen half of their team with like trees stake through them and blood everywhere from the crash. So, So mentally, they're on high alert. They find this lake and then lo and behold, they find this cabin out in the woods. I don't know, you guys, the cabin in the woods saw the start of a great horror story, but they're looking for shelter. So there it is. Um, this is like a hunting cabin that obviously whoever owned it had to helicopter or fly a private plane in. There's no roads into it. There's no like driveway. There's no electricity. It's literally a remote hunting cabin. And they do find a private airplane that obviously had been flown in by the person who owned the cabin and had some overgrowth on it. So it had been parked for a while. They do find the body of the owner in the upstairs of this cabin had been rotting for a while. And they find this interesting little symbol. Now this symbol is kind of comes and goes throughout the whole story. The symbol is obviously very potent, very important because both Natalie and Misty and Ty, as adults in present time, get a postcard with this symbol on it. Nothing else. They're all spooked. They're like, what the fuck? Who knows about what we did in the forest? Which, meanwhile, we're not 100% sure about what they're actually talking about. What happened in that? We're just as lost as the rest of everybody else. It's like, it's like what the hell happened in that forest? Some, some secret they're desperately keeping. The only person in this group of adult women that did not get a postcard is Shauna. She did not get a postcard. Well, in the meantime, Shauna meets this man named Adam. She thinks her husband, Jeff, the one she was boinking as a teenager that she was pregnant with his kid in the forest. Yeah, her husband, that guy, she thinks he's having an affair. So she meets meets this guy named Adam, who is younger than she is, and she starts having an affair. Well, then she meets back up with her old teammates, around the forest with her and they're all saying holy crap we've got these postcards and now they're getting they have a blackmailer that's asking her them for money or else he's going to expose the story of what they got up to out in the wilderness now remember everybody except shauna got this postcard now shauna also has this little habit of keeping journals she writes everything down and you see her journals kept in her safe at home with jeff well shauna gets it in her head that adam this guy she's having an affair with is actually the blackmailer and she ends up killing him she gets the idea that he's the blackmailer because one night he comes over when her husband jeff and her daughter kelly are gone and he bangs her in her marital bed and then has to hide in the closet when jeff comes home and then after jeff leaves the bedroom he skedaddles on out of there and she finds glitter in the closet which meanwhile when they were chasing the blackmailer down through a store he fell into a display and got glitter all over him so she's like oh my god Adam's the blackmailer and then she like confronts him and like kills him and then she calls her girls that her teammates Misty Natalie and Ty meanwhile remember Ty is running for a political position to basically cut the body up and they know how to cut these bodies up because why they had to survive in the wilderness okay come to find out Adam was not the blackmailer. The blackmailer was Jeff, her husband, because Jeff had all the access to the journals and his furniture store needed money. And he knew that Ty had money. So he thought, I'm just going to play this game a little bit. You end up actually, actually like Jeff. We have to remember Jeff went through trauma too, even though he was not out in the forest with them. 
both his girlfriends were out there and come to find out one of his girlfriends had a baby out there that was his. So he's got some trauma as well. Let's not forget that. So they've disposed of this body in present time. And now we're flipping. So that was the symbol, right? That was that we see in the forest. We see everywhere. They Now we're, we still don't know. We still don't know what that symbol means, guys. I don't know. Maybe tonight, last episode of season two, maybe we'll find out what that symbol means. But I have a feeling it's not going to come out. They're going to hold on to that for a little bit later. So we're going back to the plane crash. We're there now in this spooky little cabin. And um, they find some guns and Travis and Natalie are the best shot. So Travis and Natalie are responsible for going out every day and hunting. They make some mistakes along the way with the meat and the animals. But Natalie and Travis do develop a kindred relationship. Um, there are some little sex scenes. We see Jackie ends up boinking Travis at this like dooms day prom they create still i'm just like gross i think we would be so smelly i don't know if i would be able to have sex in that situation because everybody would be smelling bad i don't know maybe you just get immune to it who knows maybe you're just bored i don't know anyway but natalie and travis do end up having a very special bond you see that right away um, Travis has lost his father. He saw his father dead. Craziness. Um, in, the, in the mean, in the present day, though, Travis ends up committing suicide. Kind of. We'll get to that. And Natalie finds out, and she's distraught. She doesn't know why. Why and Misty's there, and Misty's kind of tagging along again. This is why the show is so good. This is why the show is so good. Meanwhile, in 1996, in the forest, Lottie, who has been going off of her medication, starts to have these visions again. And she starts kind of communing with nature. And she seems to have a way with nature and a way with getting them food and figuring out what they need to do. And she starts, like, sl slicing open her arm and giving the nature, like, blood. And then... The wilderness gives back and we have this this vision of what the audience has now deemed the antler queen who the fuck's the antler queen we still don't know i actually think that my theory is they're all the antler queen they've all had to be the antler queen at some point because now we're starting to see almost like this psychosis almost like this and i don't know this is why this is so freaking fascinating and i've never been stranded out in the woods in the middle of nowhere having to survive so i don't have a memory bank to pull information from to know how I would respond in this situation. Like I said, I don't think I would survive it, but if I were to survive it, what kind of a lifestyle, what would you start to believe? You right. So we see a bunch of girls starting to almost like pray to the wilderness. You got to believe in something, right? Especially when there's hope lost, like you have to believe in something. And they start to almost treat Lottie as if she's kind of like the high priestess of, of them, of the wilderness. Because she does have this knowing, like this way of knowing things that are going to happen, of being able to get the forest to give them stuff. Meanwhile, she keeps talking about how Sean is going to have a boy. She's boy is going to save them, blah, blah, blah. We get to this point where Shauna and Jackie, the two besties that virtually have the same boyfriend, although Jackie didn't know that until they were stranded in the woods and Shauna was pregnant with his baby, have this knockdown drag out fight. And so Jackie kind of gets banished to the outside to sleep outside. Now, this is when it's starting to get cold when winter is coming. Down here in the South, snow ain't nothing but an urban legend. So I do not know how I would handle snow in the wilderness. I don't even know how to handle snow in the city. So that's me. I would be done. But Jackie ends up freezing to death outside. But before Jackie died, remember that character, Laura Lee, I said that died pretty soon. Well, she decided to go try to fly the plane that was sitting there out of the forest to get them help. Plane explodes over the lake. So she that's her dead. Just FYI. So they've seen quite 
quite some tragedy. The, 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 it seems like the wilderness, the powers that be of the wilderness, have done everything it can to keep them stuck in this wilderness. Or maybe it was just the fact that Misty broke up the transmitter or whatever it's called that could have easily had them rescued very quickly. But So probably just all Misty's fault. But anyway, Jackie sleeps outside and ends up freezing to death. So now Shauna is really going through it mentally. She's pregnant. She's a child. She's a teenager. They're all living day to day wondering when their next meal is going to be. They're dirty. They don't know when they're going home or if they're going home. She's had this knockdown, drag out fight with her bestie. And now her bestie's dead. So she's carrying, carrying a lot of guilt. And so she brings Jackie's body into like this shed that's beside the cabin. And you see the caboodle that, that survived the plane crime or caboodles. And she's like doing Jackie's makeup, the corpse. Like she's having these conversations with this corpse. So ja Shauna is like really losing it, which fair play to her. I think we all probably would have started. And that's what's, again, that's what's so fascinating about this character development is that we're watching these girls psychologically. I don't want to say losing it. I think they're finding this different rhythm of survival. Like they're out in the wilderness. And so they're, they're coming into this, this kind of this world of no limitations. There are no laws out there. Only law is to survive. And so they're they're kind of pushing, whether they mean to or not, they're kind of pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable in normal society because they have to, right? In order to survive, they have to. And so there's a compassion for this strange dichotomy that's happening with the girls. They're praying to the wilderness. They've got freaking Lottie over here as like a, a pre-cult leader, which she kind of turns into later on, which we'll get to. And um now Sean is in a shed talking to her dead best friend, doing her makeup, doing her hair, and her ear falls off because bodies decompose is what they do. And um, Thaisa, who meanwhile is starting to have issues with sleepwalking and has to basically be chained to Van so that she doesn't sleepwalk. She's kind of the voice of reason with Shauna. And she's like, listen, we got to get, she's like, no, you, you, she goes into the shed. She sees this corpse with makeup on and She's like, listen, chickadoo, we have got to do something about this. You're losing your shit. You're talking to a dead body. I understand you're grieving. I understand you're freaking pregnant and, and you haven't had what you need to have a safe, healthy pregnancy. We've got to cremate Jackie. Why are we cremating Jackie? Why aren't we burying Jackie like we buried all the other bodies? Because, friends, it's the dead of winter. I'd, I asked the same question because, again, where I'm from, snow is an urban legend. So I had no idea. And then think about it, that the ground would be too frozen to dig and put a body inside of it. So we've got to try to cremate a body. And I don't know if you know this about cremation, but it takes a mighty powerful fire to cremate a body. So what happens is they accidentally cook Jackie. I laugh because it makes me uncomfortable. They cook her, y'all. Um, yeah, so they go back in the cabin. Overnight, they're going to magically think they're going to cremate this body. It ends up just cooking the body. And so they wake up in the early morning hours, and they smell. They wake up by the smell of something's been cooked. And I will say... Although this scene made me physically sick to my stomach to watch the way that they introduced the cannibalism in the story was pretty brilliant because the girls, the cat, the, the, the characters did not ever talk about cannibalism. That was never something on their mind. I don't think it was even a possibility until it came up, became a possibility. And so you see them walk out to the body and sit around the body cooked. It's Jackie cooked. And they're kind of looking at each other. And they the, the way they shot this, they shot it as if the girls were disassociating, which 100% probably would have happened. In order to do that to eat your friend, if you are a sold person, like meaning you have a soul and you have to now eat your friend to survive, 
um, you probably were going to have to disassociate, which means that you're, you, you check out during the action. You can't, it's big with trauma, happens a lot with trauma. So you watch them eat Jackie and you see them going back and forth between sitting dirty around the body to them being clean in like Greek costumes, eating fruits and wine. And, and, and so that's the disassociation, right? And then after they eaten all of Jackie. I will say I was watching some of the behind the scenes and they said that they had puke buckets for the girls because some of them were puking, shooting that be just the idea. Even though it was jackfruit, they showed how they made the body. It was jackfruit. It wasn't obviously it wasn't a real body. Um and they were having it just the, the just seeing it and it looked just like the girl who played Jackie and they did a great job. But apparently the some of the actresses were having to like vomit because of of the reality of what their characters were having to do. Meanwhile, you got Shauna who was pregnant. This is probably the only real food she's had since landing or crashing rather into the forest. And so the only person who does not participate in the eating of Jackie is coach Ben. You see him kind of have a breakdown as he's, he's the only one that seems to realize what they're doing. He goes back into the cabin, but Coach Ben himself is also having some breakdowns. Oh, in the meantime, something I forgot to mention, Javi's gone missing. Travis's little brother went missing. They don't know where he is. Natalie thinks he's dead. They can't find him. It was after they all did shrooms at the Doomsday prom or whatever. He's missing. So where's Javi? Who knows? He's Javi's not at this Let's Eat Jackie event. But my friends, Javi becomes... Or at this moment, at the end of last week's episode, he's going to be the second victim. Okay, so they did it brilliantly. The whole concept of cannibalism, I thought, was just done brilliantly with, again, it, it just accidentally happened. And they are so hungry. These girls are so fucking hungry. They're starving out there. They've been out there for months um, that it, it just it just happened. And they didn't kill Jackie on purpose, Jackie froze to death by accident, and they ate her. Anyway, so um, there's a couple episodes where they, I think they're kind of processing what they did. The next day, you see Taisha, the the one that is kind of sleepwalking and, and doing some crazy shit. She runs out and sees the bones of Jackie, and she's like, oh my god, what happened to Jackie? What happened to Jackie? And Van's like, we ate her! And she's like, what? No. And she's like, girl, you ate her face. So obviously, Thais is having a lot of issues mentally, which we see that playing out with her as an adult as well. Okay. Well, we also find out that Lottie, the girl who has the visions, the queen of the wilderness, is still alive in present day. She obviously survived with the group because they try to investigate Travis's death, his suicide, and they find out that his money was transferred to a woman named Charlotte or Lottie. They end up finding Lottie running her own cult out in the middle of the forest. They were under the impression that Lottie had been in a mental institution in Europe, but no, no. Alas, she is back and she is running her own literal cult. So all the girls end up making their way to this facility. There's a lot of other details. I know I'm skimming over you guys who are Yellow Jackets fan. Feel free to talk about it in the comment section below. But they all end up there. Natalie's trying to process the death of Travis. Lottie, it turns out, was there when Travis accidentally was very paranormal so she's kind of telling natalie that he kept saying natalie was right natalie was right what was natalie right about natalie thinks they brought the darkness back with them so we're we're building up with anticipation of there's something really fucking horrific that these girls did and in my mind at this point if they just ate jackie and it was a survival i don't think many people would have judged them i don't think it's kind of like the whole alive thing where they had to eat the butt cheeks of the dead people um you know but there's obviously more to the story and we've seen flashes of them dressed up in like cultish costumes meanwhile hobby comes back 
and he's not speaking. Nobody knows where he was. He's gone. He's gone. But no, he won't talk. We don't. We don't know how he survived in the winter. Or how he was fed. But he keeps drawing the this tree, this particular tree. All right. So keep that in mind. Then Shauna goes into labor. Because that's fun. And Coach Ben, who is the only adult there, basically was like, yeah, I can't help you with this. And so it's up to Misty. Again, it's always Misty who has to birth the baby. Now, Shauna passes out. She had some weird dream sequence where she sees them eating the baby, blah, blah, blah. And um, turns out, though, when she wakes up that the baby didn't survive, the baby died right away. Now, in every good story, there's never dead information. So all the information that we're given in a story is pertinent to the story. And for a while, my boyfriend and I were like, why the fuck did they even have her pregnant? Like, this is because the baby was just going to die. They don't eat the baby. They bury it. You know, it's they don't go that far. But Shauna is got these issues with Lottie because Lottie kept saying, oh, she's going to have a boy. It's going to be the savior of us. Yes, praise Jeebus. Like, this is the baby that's and he dies. And so Lottie and Shauna have issues. Shauna is obviously not as mystical and, and, and psychic as Lottie is. And so she thinks all of her wilderness shit is just woo woo anyway. And so Lottie basically is like, in order for you to heal Shauna, you're just going to have to beat me up. And so Shauna beats the shit out of Lottie. Like it was unbelievable to watch. I mean, I don't know who the actress was really hitting, like what, but the pounding she gave. And so Lottie's basically hanging on by a thread at this point. She's bleedy. Her body is just so broken. Misty's trying to keep Lottie alive. They're freaking out. Lottie can't die because she's like the wilderness queen and she knows what to do. And they know that if they don't get Lottie some food, that she will die because her body is so beaten up. That without food, her body is not going to have the strength to heal. So when Javi came back from wherever he was, he brought with him a queen card. A queen card from the playing, a playing deck. And this playing deck they found in the cabin, but it was missing the queen card. And people have been speculating about why the queen card is so important. Many fans speculated that when they started really eating people whoever drew the queen card was the one that had to be eaten um and they were right because we saw that last episode before they determined that someone's gonna have to be eaten coach ben all of a sudden realizes the tree that hobby drew he thinks he knows where that is so coach ben with his little homemade crutches because remember he got his leg chopped off by misty in the beginning finds the tree and realizes that there's like a tunnel under the tree. Now it's nothing, it's not a fancy tunnel. It's not like a lost situation where it's like a, it's like a dirt tunnel, but he goes in there and he sees where there was a fire pit. He sees where there's like chicken bones. And so he's discovering this while they're back at the cabin drawing to see who's going to be killed and eaten. And it turns out it's Natalie. But we know it's not going to be Natalie because Natalie survives into adulthood. So they take a necklace that Jackie wore and they put it on Natalie as like, like the sacrifice. And Shauna comes and puts the knife, knife to her throat. And then Jackie turns around and she's like, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to look me in the eyes and do it. And then Travis like freaks out and he goes and attacks Shauna and tells Natalie to run. So Natalie like bolts and runs. Meanwhile, some of the girls hold Travis back while the rest of them become like super barbaric and grab every tool they can and start chasing Natalie. They're, they're on for the hunt now. And so Natalie stops behind a tree while Javi starts to run out too. And Javi hasn't said anything till he, since he got back from wherever he was. And he was like, Natalie, I know where we can go to hide. I know where we go to hide. And so he's like, you got to trust me. Come with me. So Natalie and Javi, or Javi, as the Brits say, are running over the frozen lake. And you see the gangle of girls, like, with their spears and their weapons coming after them. And all of a sudden, Javi 
falls into the lake. Natalie's first reaction is to try to save him. Misty runs up behind Natalie and was like, no, don't do it. Let him die. It chose, meaning the wilderness chose who it wanted to sacrifice. And it wasn't Natalie. It was Javi. And so Natalie has to watch Javi as he drowns. Okay. Meanwhile, Travis's brother is back at the cabin being held down by the girls. And the last you see them for the trailer for this week, carrying Javi on a stick back to eat him. I don't know how Travis, I don't know how this is going to, I'm sure tonight's episode is going to leave us on quite a cliffhanger. And we know that there is an antler queen. We know that there's a lot of stuff, cult, occultic stuff that we have yet to see. It's it's building up to that, to getting into that place of delusion. And um, meanwhile, back at the ranch, at the real cult with the adults, and Lottie, Lottie decides that all of their lives are falling apart. Sean is wanted for murder for Adam. Taisha's life is falling apart as a politician. We've learned now that Van, adult Van, has terminal cancer. Natalie is just losing her shit. She's going through devolution instead of evolution. And Missy's just fucking boinkers and crazy. She's got a little boyfriend, though, which is kind of cute, played by Elijah Wood, which he, I think, is going to be coming back in season three with a bigger role. We'll see. But Lottie decides that the forest needs, they need to do another sacrifice of one of them. And so she creates all these drinks with the chemical in it that they use to euthanize dogs. It's a, it's a, it's going to take somebody out. She's like, I don't know which, you know, I'll pick last. We'll, we'll let the universe decide which one of us is the sacrifice. And once we make this sacrifice, all of our lives will go back to normal. And that's how we law ended last week's episode. So, that's basically the breakdown of Yellow Jackets. Like I said, we see the beautiful character development. I don't know. I can't honestly say, like, how would you, how do you think you would react if you were stuck in the wilderness for 19 months? How would you react if you had to resort to cannibalism to survive? Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that because again, with the whole Jackie situation, they, they covered that brilliantly. And I don't know if they would have even gone back to thinking about cannibalism as if it weren't for the fact that Lottie needed substance in order to survive and they were dependent upon Lottie. And if there's a darkness that's just inside human beings that causes this kind of thing to happen where it becomes like a hunting ritual, we know about those hunting games, don't we? If that's something that literally is really deep down a lot of people that is pulled out when there's survival at stake and the rules of the forest are very different than the rules of society. So let me know your thoughts. Um, I, I would love to hear, are you watching Yellow Jackets? Are you going to be watching tonight uh, the final episode of season two? Y'all are not, I, I saw they're not going to release the next season until like, March of 2024, like, what the fuck? We got to wait that long. But um, how do you think you would fare? Let me know your thoughts. Um, Hello, you everybody. This is Editing Bryce here. The, the last bit of this video cut off, so I'm doing the last part as a voiceover. Um, yeah, as I was saying, if the, the, the theme song for this show is incredible. And the no return, no return, no return comes f directly from the theme songs uh the theme song of yellow jackets as you see in the title of this video do you believe once you cross over into that darkness that there is no return um that's a really really interesting debate i personally do believe there is a return but is it the weight of the human consciousness and the karmic soul that creates this obstacle of returning back to the normalcy of being a human after you've gone through something like that? I also want to know, again, your thoughts down in the comment section below. What kind of conspiracies do you think are behind this show? We know that Hollywood is super shady. We know that. Not all of Hollywood is shady. There are literally works of art out there that are super important but is this one of those works of art i think the actresses in this are brilliant uh, the storytelling is brilliant but what are your thoughts on it? it or is this just literally a story of of the way 
human psychology works. I don't know. It's it'll. I guess only time will tell. But I would love to hear your theories down below. Of course, this is just a very brief Cliff Notes version of season one and season two. There are a lot of details, a lot of subplot storylines that I did leave out of this. So um, I highly suggest going back and rewatching season one and season two if you can, so that you have a more thorough. Um, understanding of this story and um, this last episode of season two drops tonight so maybe I'll do a follow-up video tomorrow so we can really look at the finale of season two and see what else we learn and how this will further our discussion into this show and the message of this particular show. So yeah, let me know down in the comment section below what you think. The pilot episode to Yellow Jackets, the first episode, season one, episode one, is available on YouTube for free. So I have put that down in the show notes. So make sure you look down in the description box if you want to watch the first episode, the first pilot episode to see if this is something that you want to invest in. And yeah, let me know guys. And I hope you're having a wonderful day. Buckle up because tonight is season two finale of Yellow Jackets. You guys know that I love a good workout. I love to sweat every single day. I work out about six days a week, at least two hours on my yoga mat, doing Ashtanga yoga or doing a bar class. When one works out, their muscles break down. I, I tell my students here in Atlanta, I've been sore for about 17 years. And as we start to age, we start to uh, have a harder time repairing those broken down muscles. Now, a few months ago, my my friend Catherine Edwards introduced me to the product ASEA. I had been offered sponsorships before, but I had always turned them down because the integrity of the company didn't align with my own integrity. But the more I studied about ASEA, the more I studied about the owners, the person who came up with the formula for ASEA, the more I liked this company. And then I started to try the product. So what is ASEA? Again, when you work out, when you rip your muscles apart, there has to be a rebuilding system. When that rebuild happens, that is when your body technically gets stronger. We have in our body something called redox. Redox is this thing that helps, it's a signaling system between your cells. Now, when we are young, when we're kids, before we hit puberty, we have a lot of redox. That's why children are young and healthy and they can fall out of trees and skin their knees and be fine and recover quickly. But as we get older, that redox becomes less and less and less. So it doesn't really matter how healthy the cells are and the cells cannot properly communicate with each other. This means that as we get older, we start to feel more body aches. We start to get wrinkles. We start to get saggy skin. We start to get gray hair. For men, this means that the hair starts to thin and fall out. Again, it's like having a cell phone. What's the good in having an iPhone, like my iPhone, if there's no cell system to work it? The ASEA is the cellular system. Now, again, I'm a pretty healthy person. I work really hard on my health, so I wasn't expecting a huge difference with the redox. However, the benefits that I've experienced over these last two months of being on ASEA have been unbelievable. I feel younger. I'm sleeping better. I feel like my quality of life is better. Even my hair, I've always had really thick hair, but now my hair is like gotten doubly thick and it's growing like crazy. I literally just got my hair cut like two weeks ago and I am about to have to make another appointment to get it cut again because it is unbelievable how fast my hair is growing since taking this redox system. My nails are growing faster. Even my boyfriend, my boyfriend who is in his early 50s is starting to thin out at the top of the hair as what, what happens to men. And even he is starting to notice his hair grow back, which which is common. If you look at the uh, the stories from ASEA, so many men have grown their hair back simply by adding redox back into their body. There are countless stories of people who have lowered their blood pressure, gotten off medications, cut their medications in half because their body is being supplied with the cellular system it needs to do what the body is supposed to do, and that is heal itself. Now, basically what you do is when you get your redox in, you can hear it's a liquid. It's a liquid. 
This comes with a little shot glass, a two, a two ounce shot glass. Most people will take between four and eight ounces of ASEA a day. I take eight ounces a day because I'm obsessed with this product. So you pour two ounces into the shot glass, you swish it around your mouth for 30 to 60 seconds, and then you swallow. That's it. You can't overdose with this product. If you take too much, your body will just pee it out. Now, when you take the liquid, you're allowing the intelligence of your body to take the redox where the body needs the redox to go. I've told you guys before, I struggle heavily with, it, with arthritis. And in the past, I have taken medications for my arthritis, but I do know that arthritis is caused by overthought. It's caused by anxiety. However, medication coming from my doctor only dealt with the issue of the arthritis, not the cause. Well, when I started taking the ASEA about three days into taking this, I noticed that I was a lot calmer. My anxiety had dissipated. And I thought, how interesting is that? How interesting is that? My body knew that the source of the issue with my joints was coming from my own mind. So where did it send the redox? To my mind. There's also a topical gel that I really like. So when you take the liquid, again, you're allowing your body its own intelligence to take the redox where it is needed to help heal the body. But with the topical gel, you are able to put the gel where you want it put. I have been putting this on my legs for a while now. It has helped so much with the tightening of the skin, with cellulite, with varicose veins. It's also helped with the soreness of my legs. My legs get real sore from working out. I've been actually even putting this on my boobs you guys now again i'm 40 i've never had children so my boobs don't drop that much but i've been kind of putting it on my boobs too and i tell you my boyfriend really likes that so so this is a really awesome product but despite the the vanity if you have a sore leg or a sore knee or a sore neck you can put this on and direct the redox into the area that is in pain or inflamed and the redox will help with that so i even use this when i'm on my period when i get my cramps i take some of the redox and i put it topically over the area where my uterus is and it it helps my boyfriend, again, has been putting the gel in his hair, which is helping his hair grow back. Right now, currently, if anybody knows my boyfriend, he is covered in tattoos. He has been getting tattoos since he was in his 20, and he right now currently is getting one of his tattoos touched up. And so when he comes home tonight, we're going to experiment with the gel to see if the gel heals the wound of the tattoo even faster. Now, we want everybody, I want everybody to have the best quality of life that you can have. What's the point in being a human being if you're too sick or too off balance to be able to actually enjoy your life, to be actually to be able to actually work out and have fun or to go bike riding with your children or get down and play dolls with your grandchildren. This ASEA is going to help you and help your body achieve the life that you were meant to live in happiness and peace and health and in harmony. If you would like more information on ASEA, then please text Bryce Info to 321-216-8047. Again, that's Bryce Info to 321-216-8047. If you're texting from another country please make sure you put plus one three two one two one six eighty forty seven and somebody will get back to you pretty quickly they can you can ask any questions you like of the product you can find out more information about the redox system the person on the other end of the line will walk you through every option available to you at this moment they can even try to help you get the products at wholesale prices so again knowledge is power knowledge protects and knowledge is infinite as i say all the time on this channel if you want more information please text bryce info to three two one two one one six eighty forty seven.